Okay, we're back for another conversation with Alan Adi. We're going to pick up where we left off last week talking about Herbert Brun, I believe. And um, yeah, let's just dive right in. <laughs> what one thing that's <clears throat> been happening is that um, a few of the people who look at look at these things, then uh, you know I'll get a note and somebody will make a comment and it's it's. Um, so it's wonderful. It's it's great. And Ben Toth um, was in touch, <clears throat> and and he had a comment about something you and I, John, had said last week about um, Herbert having mentioned in a conversation with Saiwi that the pieces were about um, connection tools and timbre. And and um, I'm not sure exactly in that conversation with, with Tom. I don't remember how deeply they went into it there. And I, I rather quickly a week ago just said, you know, uh, clearly touch and go is, is about tools. And then I said, well, plot makes connections between its connections. So there, there are timbral connections and then, um, oh, well, it's, connections anyway, <laughs> the way it's drawn. And um, in Stalks and Trees and Drops and Clouds, he was talking about, you know, dry timbers and wet timbers and all of this. Well, Ben, um, ben said that he had actually thought of that as reversed, that actually plot is the one, even though it's drawn connecting things, um, <clears throat> that what you have to do is find the timbres of all of these different instruments which which to make those connections it's about the timbre timbral explorations um, whereas um, in stalks and trees and drops and clouds which is the one it's up on the screen right now isn't it yeah picture of stalks um where um um even Herbert writes in the introduction to this particular one, <clears throat> um, it's about cohesion and implied cohesion. So here it's making connections or interrupting those connections. So, so where you see um, on the, the bottom uh, score here, <clears throat> there's a tree on the bottom but to make cohesion of all of those elements that make up the tree, you have to um, interrupt those connections to play the drops when they when they come through. Mm -hmm. it, in a sense, this is not this is not a huge point. All three pieces are all about all of these different uh, different ways of of dealing with your instruments. For instance, you see here again in in the stalks and trees and the drop and the clouds, so they're all here, um, that they come in different sizes. And for each of the pieces, uh, since, um, since Herbert decided that dynamics are traditionally sort of low to high here, um, it's the size of the shape that implies the timbre that you're searching for. So the biggest whatever you decide your square is, the biggest square is the most normal vol voluminous best timbre and the smallest square is the most distorted, unusual um, kind of timbre, et cetera, throughout all of them. Same thing even in, in Touch and Go, um, all of the different sizes, again, refer to the most, the biggest one is the most normal, most voluminous kind of way to use that stick and the smallest one, irrespective of how you're doing it with your um, wrist or arm or whatever, still you have to consider how to make either the best normal timbre or the most distorted, however you wanna use that word. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, what did I, yeah, so, okay. So here's a picture of, again, stalks, uh, um, of no, plot, uh, right? plot. Yeah, plot. <laughs> Um, um, where you see the you know the different even even when they're sitting individually you see very easily that they come in um, different sizes, 
And here, what did I do here? Oh yeah, okay, so this is, this. I wanted to show you this. <clears throat> Just gives a little picture of, of what Herbert was um, really working with. This is an intermediary, intermediate um, graphic. Just a little, it's, it's one little excerpt. They all came, as we said last week, on, 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 on long scrolls. You know, the, the machine was rolling. And this thing is, I don't know how many, yards and yards, many yards long um, in one continuous uh, printing. So this is just a tiny little slice of these yards. And this is the first, the first one between plot and what became touch and go. So you see here that already, instead of connecting um, a stop sign to a Z, whatever, that he, he got the computer to, okay, make the line, but don't connect it. And so he already had this, he already noticed that this could sort of look like a stick floating somewhere. But the first thing the computer did, these sticks are just, floating all over the place and they're on top of one one another and it so this is not clear what you would do with this and he also had the idea from the beginning that okay if it's just going to be sticks somehow i have to find a way to 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 imply the phrases um during which you're going to use these sticks so that's what all of these rectangles floating around here are at different, because he also had the idea that, that the phrases could expand or contract, get bigger, get smaller, um, would have a, a trajectory, each one of them. But the computer, okay, it, the computer took all of these millions of numbers on, on IBM punch cards and gave Herbert this picture. <laughs> Which you know at three a m some night Herbert had to look at that and said, "Well, yeah, this is not this is not a music score. Um, what can I tell the computer to to get this straightened out? you know so it be, could become so here you you here you can see this is a, a page, so he got the computer then to put all of the little um uh, rectangular phrase structures which rise and fall on the bottom half of the page and he got the computer to put the sticks on the top part of the page. So this is what the whole um, touch and go looks like and you can see how here's what he saw and, and what he had to figure out, okay, what mathematical information do I have to give that stupid computer for it to do something more useful? I, I also just chose this one. <clears throat> um, it's obviously, it's just one of my pages, meaning that you can't just, these things are so complicated that you can't just, um, um, you can't play from these scores the way they're sitting there. So mine, uh, every page of mine looks like this. And I, I'm just noticing now as I look at this <clears throat> um, uh, up at the top center of the page, uh, I see that um, there's a little 07 and it says leave out the Super Bowl. And then there's an 18 uh, and a question mark what to do with. So, <laughs> So every time I come back to it, you know, I have some new idea about what what the hell did I mean when I did this? And uh, um, but you can even see in the beginning that um, the first thing I have to do is something with a little whisk broom, which is clearly an upstroke, and then immediately, what is that kind of upside down Y there? So the upstroke, uh, it's coming up and it's near the top of the um, the clock face, you know, it's like at 11 o'clock, 10, 30, 11. So it's a big upstroke. So that whisk, that whisk brush is a, is a big gesture with a brush and then follows um, this thing, which is for me is the pencil. <clears throat> and the pencil is, is like pointing down at, five o'clock. So it's very close to the, to the top of the table. It's a real hand gesture, almost a finger kind of gesture. And you see all those check marks. So I whisk away with one hand and then and then I start making check marks on the table with a pencil. Uh, the next thing I do is a saw 
that Z shape and, and I drew the little, I mean, you see that on the first shape, I drew the bristles. So I would remember that that was a brush. On the third one, I drew the teeth. So I'd remember that that was a saw. And, and, and so the saw goes and you see the picture of what I do with the saw, etc. cetera. That's, um, <clears throat> so the, the little squares down at the bottom, the, or the not squares, the rectangles, right? The yes. parallelograms, mm -hmm. those things yeah, are mm -hmm. phrase lengths yeah. <clears throat> or, or uh, they show the dynamic up or down. It's, it's, not, um, I, that's I, the I, gesture. Shape. It's the it's the gesture. Okay, and, okay. And I don't have it in front of me how he describes the thing, but he allows. I mean, he even proposes it might be a it might be a dynamic shape. It might be a gestural shape. It Got might it. be you know something about the phrasing. And, and as you, I mean, if you look here, it's it's not perfectly clear. I mean, actually, in the in in this one, um, it's not always going to be that the picture of the stick is absolutely coordinated with a picture of a parallelogram. There might be more sticks than parallelograms or more parallelograms than sticks, or they might be floating in slightly, they don't necessarily stop or start in the same place. So, so there's a, this is another place where um, as you develop your interpretation of this, you begin to realize that he wants you to find your own way of why you should change a stick at a certain point and and how you're going to deal with that. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did I put next here? Let's look. Um, at the same time, he was making, uh, or after the first three percussion graphics, he got going on making making what he ended up calling a series um, mutatis mutandis, this Latin phrase, which kind of means um, to change what can be changed, to mutate what is mutatable um, is the title. And you see that all of these same little um, kind of odd pictograms are still there, the stop signs, the squares, all of that. And also different ways of the computer connecting them. So, so you can already see that there's cle you know, clearly some sort of structure going on here. It's not just a mess, messy picture, <laughs> um, but it's not yet a beautiful piece of art. It's not something that's clear how you would use it as a score. He kept working on it and already here's another one where you can see Let's, you can see how different kinds of wave forms, you know, sine waves and um, sawtooth or triangle waves, that is thing, things from the, from the vocabulary of computer music, electronic music and, and the mathematics of that are clearly present here. And if you look, um, this is one that Gary Kvistad and I used and, and made a piece out of what we did, um, we um, we we taped it to a window in his house, and then taped tracing paper over it, um, the window, so that obviously there would be light coming through. And then we took turns and we traced onto a separate piece of paper. We did it, you know, I don't know, 50 times or however many times. So we got um, one piece of paper which just showed the stop signs and another which just showed the exits and another which just showed certain different kinds of messy lines. You see sort of at, um, about a, a third of the way through, uh, there's, there's this figure that goes from the bottom and it sort of disappears into the top of a big wave of complication there. Um, and we we didn't do this, but we always joked that it looked like a, we should have a grand piano that we could push off of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a good, it's, that's an easy one to see where it's one, two, three, four, five. It's five lines, da 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 and it's just floating in space. It keeps, you know, it keeps um, in a three-dimensional space. 
those five lines are transformed. And every line on this page is, is sort of doing that, that same kind of thing. It's, it's easy to see at the end, all of the discrete symbols, the X and the triangle and the plus, all of those things are all running the same kind of pattern, um, but each one has their own uh, individual unique tra trajectory of the same instruction. <clears throat> So this is this is a kind of piece where Herbert says it's a graphic score for anybody to interpret. The idea is not to be simplistic about it. In that sense, the percussion pieces are, are more simple. You see you see a, a picture floating at a certain height, at a certain moment in time, in a certain size, and it means something. You play that at that moment. Here, that's exactly what he didn't want. Um, if it's high on the page, if it looks like a glissando going up, um, he, he didn't want a simplistic kind of um, immediate improvisatory musical response, but rather to study it and find out what, are, what is the system that generated this? What, how would you describe in prose or in, in your own numbers, you know, the same way you might analyze any piece of music, you analyze a piece by Webern and come away with all kinds of numbers. Um, here, here it is. Um, so that's why Gary and I had this idea to trace it and actually, you know, find out how it, where every piece went. Um, it turns out <clears throat> that at the same time, back in nineteen in the late sixties. He also figured out a way to then separate these things out instead of all being um, printed over one another, because obviously the way he made that previous graphic, the, the computer runs through it over and over many times, overlaying different processes. So here, he rather than have them being laid one on top of the other, it passed through four times, but in each time it moved down a band. So this is a quartet and you can see that there are actually four, four systems here running left to right. <clears throat> um, you can maybe see the date on the bottom of, bottom of this one. It says um, um, July 20th, 1987. So I thought, and I think all of us thought, that this was a, a, an idea much later in his life, 20 years later, because Sylvia Smith again has published um, a whole folio of these, and there are many, many more. She published just a few of them um, called Floating Hierarchies. He named them in the late 80s, Floating Hierarchies. And they are duos or trios or quartets. So this is a quartet. <clears throat> Um, and again, a big set of instructions about the, the idea of the floating hierarchy is that if you do it with four people, um, you should play it four times and you just keep switching parts so that everybody contributes um, in a different way. The, the hierarchy of who is the first player who might be determining certain things keeps floating through, throughout the um, process of doing this. Um, and I had often thought that after 20 years of the, you know, of the, of the daunting sophistication of something like this, that he finally said, well, maybe there's a way I can make this more um, inviting to musicians, make it easier for a musician to read. So I'll separate it all out and, uh, and let people look at it in this sort of way. <clears throat> um, but in going through his, uh, the archive in, Urbana a couple of years ago, I found one that's dated 1967 and it's called uh, Fourth Quartet. And um, it has all, and then in his handwriting, there were pages of graph paper about um, instructions for two violins, viola and cello about how to play this, this piece. He had written three string quartets by the mid 1960s, and it was perfectly clear that he had already done this 
um, at that same time in the 19, late 1960s, had the idea that his fourth string quartet should be played from this kind of notation. And, um, you know, uh, clearly had no takers <laughs> at that time. He had written his previous three quartets for the, the La Salle Quartet, very famous, fabulous, you know, professional quartet who played a lot of a lot of new music. Um, so he probably showed it to to the LaSalle's and they said, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a, a stretch for a string quartet. So Herbert put it away for 20 years and, uh, mm -hmm. and here, here it reappeared. Um, <clears throat> um, as he kept doing this, now if you compare, th this is, Already by the 1970s and in the 1980s, he was able to control the computer more and more um, uh, to the point that these are clearly no longer something that a musician is going to look like, look at and figure out how to translate into. They, they become, if you like this sort of thing, they become beautiful graphics, you know, wall pictures, um, and some of them come in very, very big sizes. Um, <clears throat> some galleries have them. Um, <clears throat> and all of them are, are, are still from the same basic kind of mathematical systematic structures. And they all have to do with, he, he wrote an essay somewhere a little bit about um, each point, as he said, rather than each point just following its own path, each point or each point within a certain subset of these points checks in with all other points before moving forward. And that's what gives it all of this undulating three-dimensional sort of thing. You can imagine, you could trace either of these pictures, the outline of the picture, and it would just be one straight line. That would be one point following its own path. The reason these things all just keep shimmering back and forth and turning in is that mathematically every point is checking in with every with another point before it goes on. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so as we were saying last week, um, encountering, I mean, really being with Herbert a lot in these times, this around the same time that I got to know Frederick Jeffsky was a fascinating time to be talking to two people, both of whom were clearly very uh, conscious of being contributors through their music, through their composition to the society in which they were living. And they cared about socio-political ideas and structures, but both of them did it in such a different way. And this was actually an example where you would look at this and you're not going to think that about this. And yet Herbert said, no, it's generated specifically from the social idea of not following your own path, but checking in with others in your subset and occasionally checking in with the entire society before you make your next move. Hmm. And then to write that into a computer program. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Let's see, what did I think we should look at next? Ah, okay, well, um, so in, um, <clears throat> let's go back to this one. Um, in 1974, um, the Black Earth Group had already moved from Urbana um, to, to um, DeKalb. <clears throat> And Herbert, but Herbert had begun while we were there, he had begun a big chamber music piece for us called uh, At Loose Ends for full percussion and um, piano. Um, it uses uh, a quarter tone marimba. It's, uh, it's the only piece that was ever written for us with quarter tone marimba. Um, because the Black Earth had put this on our list of available instruments. We didn't specifically ask anybody to, to write for that. But what had happened uh, is that in my last year at, at Oberlin, um, as a high school kid, when I was studying with Mike Rosen, uh, 
Mike Rosen was in the Milwaukee Symphony. I was in Sheboygan. I went down to Milwaukee. Um, and I, I, I was able to buy a marimba from a local um, Sheboygan old drummer. It was a three octave marimba. Um, a very uh, nice, uh, beautiful Deegan instrument, but you know, from that era of marimba orchestras in the 30s, something like that. <clears throat> It was fine for what I needed to do in my first you know, years of marimba lessons. Um, in those years at Oberlin, uh, I didn't use it anymore. Um, and um, I, uh, I, uh, I had this idea that, I, because we were very interested in Harry Parch, Gary and I, had, learned something about Harry Parch and all of these kind of things. And I wondered whether it wouldn't, you know, who, who needs a three active marimba? What if this whole marimba could be tuned a quarter step flat? And then like a big organ keyboard, you would have a, a quarter tone marimba. Um, so it was just at that time that Bill Uhas in Ithaca, New York, <clears throat> started his business Fall Creek Marimbas. And I saw a little advertisement, you know, a new, little um, um, cottage industry uh, uh, percussionist who, the, the percussionist in fact, to whom Stalks and Trees and Drops and Clouds is dedicated because right. he was a grad student um, at, in Illinois years before. Okay, a new marimba tuning business. Okay, so I, I write to, to Bill and say, I have a three active marimba. I would like the whole thing tuned a quarter step flat. Can you do that? And I get the, um, okay, sure, send it. So he tunes the quarter step flat, he sends it back. <clears throat> now I have, or the Black Earth Group now has a quarter tone marimba and uh, it's listed on our list of things. Well, Herbert was the only person who was fascinated by this. And he, so he wrote this, this big, this big, uh, beautiful, um, chamber ensemble piece. And he uses it in a fascinating way in that um, there's a huge ra rack of Almglocken. And of course the Almglocken are all not beautifully, perfectly pitched, but the, even these are all microtonal and complex. And so this is what gave him the idea that, well, this would be a fun way to, to use the, this quarter tone marimba. And the way the piece this there's a big section of the piece where you, you know you play on the normal marimba then you play another uh, a related gesture a quarter tone flat you know reach up to the other one you know back and forth and as they get closer and closer and finally they're integrated and you're playing it you know shifting back and forth with one hand on each keyboard um well two things about this one <clears throat> I guess nobody else has a quarter tone marimba like that. But so the few other people who have played the piece, Herbert has always said, you know, it's fine. Just put a second instrument up there. It could be a, a vibraphone because my marimba was only a quarter, to, uh, only a three octave marimba. So it's the same as a vibraphone, just F to F. So a vibraphone works. So he said, you know, that's fine. It doesn't actually have to be, a, it just, if you have a different timbre, it'll shimmer and be different. Or take another marimba and put preparations or uh, like um, um, wax paper, you know, to make it a, a Mexican mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. sort of whatever. <clears throat> um, so uh, a couple of other people, it's been played a few other times, but that's the solution <laughs> for, for that problem. The funny part of the story is that, of course, years later, um, Bill Uhas came came to Cincinnati. Bill, when the Black Earth Group disbanded, and I found two new partners. They were Bill Uhas and Jim Cully. And Bill Uhas. So this was how many years? I don't know, five, six years later, um, at least, maybe more. <clears throat> um, Bill, you know, we were having a beer sometime over the group, and he says, "You know, I never told you this, but." Um, I started, when I started Fall Creek, um, the very first letter I got, you know, he said, I was, I was excited about, you know, I wanted to tune marimbas and help people. The very first letter I got is some little idiot 
student in Oberlin who wants his who wants his marimba a quarter step flat. He said, "I couldn't believe it." <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was doing. That was his first job. Um, but yeah, he did it. It was great. Um, um, so in 1974, there was this big, beautiful, um, you know, quite traditional. It's all very traditional uh, chamber music. Um, very much fun to play, hard, hard to play. <clears throat> The other piece that he wrote in 1974 is a, um, a chamber ensemble piece called In And and Out. Um, his idea was that it should be played at the beginning of a program and at the end of it. You would play the first half at the beginning of the program and the in and, and then you play the second half of that piece as the last piece on that new music ensemble program, the and out. <clears throat> in this piece, the percussion part, for the first time, he writes for something he called a tambrack. Um, and that's where, uh, that's where, well, oh, sorry, I'm going wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, up here in the left-hand, uh, upper left-hand corner, you see three tambracks, um, a tambr, a rack of tambours, a tambrack is what he called them. Um, and his idea was, uh, and he had, he had spoken to me when I was a student at Oberlin and, and Herbert visited, um, that would have been in 72. Somehow he had hit upon this idea that, you know, with all of the idea of the, the huge percussion setups and all of these random instruments all over, wouldn't it be interesting to, to, to get them a, a, aligned in some way to, to put them all on a rack so that you would have something that was a little bit more fluid and you could almost like a prepared piano that you could just go up and down this sort of rack of timbres. <clears throat> so he wrote the first piece with this idea for himself uh, and made the percussion part in, in that chamber ensemble piece like that. Um, Michael Udow was a student there then in the, uh, um, went back for his doctorate in, in the mid 70s, um, after his year with the Black Earth Group. And Michael also then obviously talked to Herbert about this and picked up on this idea. Mike Udow has a, a, a piece or two from that era for, uh, I mean, I think he has a piece called Tambrac Quartet. He actually wrote mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> um, so, the connection here is that what I'm, what you're looking at on the page is a, um, is something from, again, much later. Um, this is from the piece called um, Infraudibles, Infraudibles with Percussion. Infraudibles was his first computer music piece back in the, in the, uh, in also around uh, 67. Um, he made one version, which is just the computer sounds. He then wrote um, a quintet for any five instruments that could or didn't have to be played along with this electronic music. Um, in the late 80s, in the, uh, here in Cincinnati, the group was doing once in a while, we would have house concerts at, you know, big, big, big houses, people who would have the LaSalle Quartet, you know, for an evening to come and play something. And a few people had, had uh, with really big houses, had invited us to come. And I asked Herbert if he could have an idea. Um, and I, I think I suggested this. I said, you know, if we had... Um, for instance, in Fraudables, maybe it could even be played over like a home speaker. It doesn't have to be a big, strong, powerful um, computer music uh, um, piece, but some delicate little percussion music that would fit in somebody's living room and could be played along with electronic music over their speakers. So uh, he was um, intrigued by this idea. Uh, and this is the piece then called In Fraudables with Percussion from 1987, I think. <clears throat> and these are the little setups. The, um, it says alto, soprano, soprano, those things are, are drums, and it certainly does not mean bass drum. It's actually, a, we each have a snare drum and two bongos. Uh, 
but he was just showing the relationship between the the three setups so so um the lowest is the lowest snare drum and then everybody had a snare drum and a pair of bongos and then you see we had an ohm glock and a wood block vibe bar which we uh, vibe bar and ohm glock vibe bar um his it was just too complicated to get an individual vibraphone bar. We've always used an aluminum tube tuned to that pitch. But you can see how with a snare drum and two bongos at the left side, and then a little piano keyboard like of a few instruments, this became again, a rack, so to speak, something that you could just slide over. And um, it doesn't matter what you're, it doesn't matter what's low, what's high, what note you're playing. It's just a physical picture of how to get to the, to the instruments you want to play. A ta it's a tablature. Know what I mean? Does that yeah, it, but in this case, are the are the pitched instruments supposed to be those pitches or not? In this case, the, he thought they would be. Okay. Um, I would say, um, and you would say too, he was mistaken about the wood blocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we we said, uh, okay, low wood block, high wood block. Good, yeah. Good okay. Block. And and he was perfectly happy with that. The the others are all specific pitches. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, the reason that I thought of this, and maybe we'll come back to that in a moment. Ah, well, one other thing. So here's a, here's a uh, picture of one page of that score. Um, you see that he he drew it on graph paper, and all of us percussionists so appreciate this thoughtfulness a little extra trouble on the uh, composer's part, not to write this on a stupid five line piano staff, which has nothing to do with what we're doing. So you see on the, the you know, these are three different parts, um, and, you know, um, tam, uh, on the top, there's a tambrec and for three drums, you only need one line. So below the line, on the line or above the line tells you which of the three drums to use. And then above that are two lines, which are enough to show you which of the five instruments that are sitting on your table to use. So this is, again, now when you look at this notation, I don't know if I'm playing an E flat or a C sharp, or if I'm playing a woodblock or not, it doesn't matter, it's I'm just, going for the ta the same way if you play a, a prepared piano you look at the uh, any cage prepared piano piece you know it looks like beethoven when you put your fingers to the keys something completely else is happening it's sort of where this idea comes from um, <clears throat> okay so this reminded me that we could go back to something john you and i <laughs> We were talking about a couple a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, so here is this piece um, that Cage made for us. Um, music for however many people. <clears throat> um, the three for per three percussion parts. There are now four percussion parts, but the, the three were made for us to play as a concerto. And you see here. Um, it's it's um, it's by this um, um, time window thing. So at the very beginning, you see that um, the first phrase can start anywhere between zero and or as late as thirty seconds, and it should uh, end by no sooner than fifteen seconds and no later than forty-five seconds. So um, even though it's written in proportional time notation, you have the, the choice. If, you're, you, if you start as early as possible and end as late as possible, you can have 45 seconds to proportionally get through that. If you want to play it as fast as possible, you can't wait for, you know, you, either you start at zero and you get done by 15 seconds, or you can start at 29 seconds and get done by 45. Mm -hmm. The point, however, here is that you see he wrote it for 50 instruments, and unlike 
Herbert, <laughs> um, thinking about being kind to the reader of the music, um, Cage's computer program put these 50 instruments on one five-line staff. <laughs> um, he, I think when Cage saw it, he said, oh, well, this is pretty annoying. So at least he numbered each instrument. So, um, uh, so it goes from one to 50, and no matter how many ledger lines there are, at least he's, you don't have to every time count the ledger lines, he'll tell you, yeah, this is number 45, or this is number 15, or whatever. All right, so this is a drag to look at, right? This is, um, this is not inviting to play. I, you, you, can, you can imagine the um, ambivalence, being in both places, how, gee, John Cage wrote a piece for us. This is, you know, how we can't wait to get it. This is how fabulous. And then you see this and you, hmm, 50 instruments for each of us. That's 150 different instruments. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> so we didn't play it as much as we wished we might. <clears throat> um, my other colleagues dealt with this. I think the fact that I played organ in high school, I was a church organist. I had the idea of, you know, pulling out stops of an organ in a chain, you know, you play one thing, you switch the sh stop and it's something else. Yeah. Or pl pl playing prepared piano, you know, you press a key and it does something else. And I remembered this whole thing of Herbert's idea of the tambrac. So, um, down here at the very bottom, uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, it's a little messy, it's very messy, but can you sort of see, I drew, this is a drawing of, of a setup, and <clears throat> there's sort of um, uh, uh, the, those that are all in a row start with, you know, kind of a, a tabla in the position of an, of an A natural, and then there's a drum, uh, a drum looking thing that looks like it's in a position of a B, B flat, sort of. Then there's a wood block, which is in C, at C, a castanet C sharp, etc. Then from, from the C natural position wood block, all the way up to the C natural and octave above is a flower pot. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yep, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> has nothing to do with pitch. It has nothing to do with low to high. It has nothing to do with anything except that um, it's just a, it's a, it's a table of timbres. Um, <clears throat> so what I did, so if you look up, up above, um, what it meant is that I had to go through the entire cage score and um, um, with white, you know, I, I, with, I kept every note in exactly the place that Cage had drawn it. But then I traced down and if something was, um, you know, 15 ledger lines above the staff, you see in the middle, in the very middle of the page at the top there, there's a 14 E flat and I've written above it CRT, it was a crotale, right? So I went through the whole score and renotated it, keeping everything in the exact place that Cage had printed but I reduced it all to one huge, you know, huge in space and size keyboard, <clears throat> um, which meant um, that the time, the hours spent doing that, it was then very satisfying for me. I could just come to the setup and play. I could, I, you know, my hands just knew where to go and I hit the thing that was there. You see at um, then where it says 235 to 350 on the second system, that's where the, the next phrase begins in that time phrase. And there are all these little things where, you know, the arrows, that's like the organ stop moment where I have to switch out. I have time and I have to switch out a bunch of instruments. So, because I still 50 instruments, I mean, that's four octaves of stuff. I'm not gonna, there was, there was no reason to build four octaves of this because some instruments are used a great deal 
and other instruments are used once or twice or three times. So if you look back down at the picture again at the bottom, again, you see, um, I don't know, like the one, the picture of a castanet and then there's an arrow and it says um, smallest Hong Kong and then it says woodblock or um, um, or the in the B flat position, there's a sandpaper and then it becomes a tin can and then it becomes something, I don't know, oh, it goes back to sandpaper. Anyway, throughout the piece, I had to find moments where I had downtime, where all of these pictures that are surrounding the t my table are the extra instruments. And I had the instruction, like an organist changing the stop, swap out these three instruments for these three instruments, you put those away, and now just play again. <laughs> and it will, uh, some of the sounds would be the same and some would be different. Um, um, you know, I, I guess I, I admire very much uh, my colleagues for dealing with reading that score with, you know, 15 ledger lines above and below. Um, <laughs> but, um, we spent our time in different ways. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I did, I had fun doing it this way. Um, and that was my solution. Um, are there any more? I think that's the, that's where I arrived at the end. Of, so anyway, it was just uh, in, in thinking about the conversations we've had, I, I was, um, uh, um, I hadn't planned on how I, I should tie together Herbert Brun and John Cage, and I just stumbled across this thing where um, it really did, in experiences with one composer, really informed a way to solve things with, with the other. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, there was, and I thought of another thing Herbert used to always say, <clears throat> um, to composers, to composition students, um, to all of us, you know, to, um, that he was interested in, for himself, he was interested in writing the music he didn't yet like. To write, write the music you don't yet like. Which is, you know, um, just that sentence is, um, uh, you have to think about that for a moment. Why, why would you do that? What does that mean? It's another point, which is so much like Cage. The whole idea of Cage saying that, um, um, well, if I know what it's going to sound like, I don't need to write it. I write music because I don't know what it sounds like. That's what's interesting about, uh, and Cage's way of doing it was to do it by chance operations, to find out. And then Cage, as you'll uh, remember, always used to say, you know, what can be criticized about my work is the questions I asked. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Well, it means that, that he honestly followed the systems that he set up and the systems then produced the compositions, which were the, the, the audible realization of, of those um, chance derived systems. Meaning that um, if, one, if one would ever, if you did this for yourself, and it's very interesting, I think it's a good it's a process. You can imagine that the questions you ask to get, um, chance determined answers to, it makes a huge difference in what, what order even you ask the questions. Okay, you want to make a piece. And if your first question is, is it sound or silence? Well, then statistically, half your piece is going to be silence. If that question doesn't come until much later in your list of questions, if you say, is it going to, whatever, is it going to be loud or soft? Is it going to be fast or slow? Is it going to be, da, 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 you know, is it going to be for the bassoon or is it going to be for the snare drum? Is it going to be whatever you can think of? All kinds of questions. And, and um, is, going to, is going to statistically give a much different kind of, I'm sorry, that's the simplest possible <laughs> example, but, but you, you, I think you follow the point. That's what he meant. You could criticize what questions he was exploring and the order in which he was exploring them to get the results. But the result, that's why he said, you could criticize my questions, but, but the results are honest to what I asked. Um, and Herbert was then, that, that's that, that, that 
philosophical statement to write the music you don't yet like um, just meant that, you know, for all of us, we all do this, right? You get up in the morning and you walk to the marimba and, and it's sitting there and you want to warm up and you start playing some little exercises and going up and down the marimba. And if you remember some very cool common tone chord hip Miles Davis changes, you can go here and go there. And um, I, that's wonderful. We should all do that. Um, and then we'll find some, oh yeah, I like that. That feels, that feels good. That sounds good. That sounds cool. Um, Herbert was saying, yeah, you should do that for yourself. But if you want to make contributive music, maybe the questions have to be a little bit more thoughtful than, than that. It can't be just what you already like. Right. Um, is, is, where that, is where that sentence comes from. <laughs> One of the one uh, his quotes that I always remember that that I often say is that um, about about composing is that you should you sh you your job as a composer is to compose something that without you wouldn't exist yes. and to find that place to find what that is what are all those things that are swirling around that make you you uh, and and how to do that in in a composition and how to make that a unique, a unique con contribution. Yeah, he would say with, without you and without your intent would not come to be. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, um, there's a, uh, there's another piece, again, as we began here talking about some of the conversations that, that, um, your sessions here have engendered um, Joey Van Hassel uh, mentioned, said, well, you know, th these, these pieces are, are fascinating, um, but the piece that everybody probably in the percussion world knows best is the piece Just Seven for Drum. It, it's a, a snare drum solo published in the Noble Snare series and, um, you know, people who know that piece might even be surprised by the complexity of all of these other very different kinds of musics. <clears throat> and it just made me think of, again, the curiousness about that piece that, that Herbert says in the, in the notes, that the snare drum should be, should be set higher than normal and tilted towards the player, and you should play in profile to the audience. And then he, in the instructions are, he draws seven, I think it's seven circles, seven regions from the center of the drum to the extreme edge and mm -hmm. everything in between. So when, so, so if you're in profile, you know, when you, when you're playing, you're, you're doing this all, all the time. Right. Um, well, what the, what is that about? Um, what's funny about that is that, um, Herbert was probably the the biggest fan of Tom Siwi's um, U U of I steel band of anybody in town. Herbert was there for every <laughs> performance of the steel band. <laughs> um, you know, it's something that you can love about these um, difficult, deep, tremendously philosophical people, you know, that they're very complete people. Um, yeah. And as we, as I said last week that her, you know, Herbert spent what, I don't know, 20, 20 years as a, a, a lounge pianist in Tel Aviv, you know, could play any tune that anybody shouted out uh, and improvise on it. And so he loved the steel band. And um, when, when, <clears throat> when he was asked for, to contribute a snare drum piece, it was just at a time when he was, you know, paying a lot of attention to to uh, the steel band, and that's what that is. It's a picture of somebody playing a steel drum and moving back and forth at an angle in profile. Yeah. I mean, of course, it makes it then fascinating for the drum itself, all the different sounds of edge and center, and um, I mean, I'm, I I realize I stumbled onto a. A moment where I can say something that I like to say these days about the snare drum is that um, um, 
there's come to be such a um, you know such such a, such a way of playing the snare drum seriously these days about um, moving to the edge for quiet things and and you move to you know there's lots of moving back and forth and uh, you know all these fabulous orchestral players and they're sort of teaching this um all the time um and what's curious about it is that <clears throat> with 21st century thousand dollar snare drums well in fact you know they they respond beautifully anywhere you play them in in any sort of way and you could also you could stay right in the center and using height above the drum you can play from the threshold of audibility to the threshold of pain and it'll respond all in one all in one spot whereas 50 years ago um, to get a snare drum to sound really good in the center and crispy and, and powerful and all of that, the snares were probably were too tight to be really sensitive to soft playing. And you had, edge, to, yeah. you had to go to the edge to get, to get the snare sound. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, it's fine. But just so you realize it's a choice, that when you're going to the edge, you're making a timbral change. You're not making a dynamic change. You're making a timbral change. If you want, it, if you want that timbre, fine. But, there's, but sometimes you, you see people in very sophisticated pieces where all they'd have to be doing is changing up and down from loud to soft this way and have one good sound right here, whereas they're also going back and forth this way, adding a yeah. lot more physical resistance to the whole process um so anyway here's a piece by herbert again where <clears throat> the edge and center have nothing to do with loud and soft you might be playing really loud out at the edge or really soft right in the center or going back and forth between the two and it's it's a it's a fascinating little timbral ex exploration again of yeah. all this this kind of stuff <clears throat> um well, we should, uh, we should wrap here for this session and think about what we want to do next time. Um, but this, this has been really good to detail all of these pieces and... Yes, thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to you and Bonnie. I learned how to put these things on my screen. <laughs> yeah, this is really nice, actually. We should do this again with some more... I was thinking, you know, you have so many, su such good insights into all of these... Uh, graphic scores and this is a great medium for looking at some of that 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 might be a fun topic for next time is choose a handful of your favorite graphic scores and let's throw them up on the screen and and walk through them that would be that could be fun now that you and bonnie have taught me how to do that <laughs> shout out to bonnie whiting for <laughs> our, our tech guru um, yeah okay great well this is good okay again Okay, good. Thanks.